I found just since I was a kid, I just want to know. I'm just so curious. How is the world made up? Why is this <laughs> happening? What is this that's happening? I've just been enthralled since I can remember. So you'll see I have many theory videos uh, in the past. I try and make around one a month. And here we go. This one is kind of tries to link them all. This will be the theory video that links all theory videos. So today we'll be discussing the fascinating work by Ilya Prigogine. I'm sure I said that correctly. He was a Russian born Belgian physical chemist who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1977. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. Prigogine's work revolutionized our understanding of complex systems, including living organisms. This is the key point. He applied the second law of thermodynamics to those systems. He argued that as long as they receive energy and matter from an external source, they can go through periods of instability and self-organization, resulting in more complex systems whose characteristics cannot be predicted except as statistical probabilities. What this means is Prigogine is saying that the universe is indeterminate. So it's indeterminate, meaning it's probabilistic. It's not determined as in A pushes B and creates C. Prigogine's work applied the second law of thermodynamics to complex systems, including life. The second law states that physical systems tend to slide spontaneously and irreversibly toward a state of disorder, a process driven by an increase in entropy. It does not, however, explain how complex systems could spontaneously arise from less order states and have maintained themselves in defiance of the tendency toward maximum entropy. Meaning, if the second law of thermodynamics states everything goes towards entropy, towards disorder, right, increasing entropy, then how do we exist? How is life here? It doesn't make mathematical sense. The way all of the physicists have gotten out of this problem in the past is they say, oh, Earth is not a closed system. We're only talking about closed systems. Okay, we're only talking about closed systems, right? <laughs> Prigogine argued that as long as systems receive energy and matter from an external source, non-linear systems, or dissipative structures, as he called them, can go through periods of instability and then self-organization, resulting in more complex systems whose characteristics cannot be predicted except as statistical probabilities. So what, what he's saying is if you pump energy into a system, it can create complex systems, more complex systems. So basically, how does complexity arise out of simplicity? If everything goes towards disorder, then why do we have complexity, right? It's like almost half of our equations are missing. Prigogine defined dissipative structures and their role in thermodynamic systems far from equilibrium, a discover that, discovery that won him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1977. In summary, Ilya Prigogine discovered that importation and dissipation of energy into chemical systems could result in the emergence of new structures, hence dissipative structures, due to internal self-reorganization. That's you pump energy into a system, a living organism type system, and he says complex systems, dissipative structures will emerge. Dissipative structures theory led to pioneering research in self-organizing systems, as well as philosophical inquiries into the formation of complexity on biological entities and the quest for a creative and irreversible role of time in the natural sciences. This is a big problem with our current physics models, right? It doesn't include time. You can literally take time out of the equation. That's the problem with quantum mechanics and gravity. That's why they can't relate them together, right? Gravity, you can't actually find gravity in real reality. You can only find gravity through its effects through time right? <laughs> if you're falling, I can't really tell if I just take a picture. I can tell basically because I know that your hair will be falling up and all this stuff. But what if you're laying down, right? We can't really tell in a photo. A photo doesn't tell. Go to the top of a tall building and step off of it. The instant you step off the building, the gravitational field in your immediate vicinity instantaneously vanishes. Or as Einstein wrote, ceases to exist. You can prove this to yourself 
by performing the free body test for inertial motion as you fall. Just like the unaccelerated observer in the rocket ship, you will discover that, neglecting air resistance, if you toss objects off yourself while falling, these objects will float away with uniform motion. Carry a spring with you, it won't compress. Try to weigh yourself on a scale, and you'll get a reading of zero. According to Newton's laws, you therefore must conclude that your frame of reference is inertial and that you are not accelerating. All right, it's kind of like a stoppage of time. You can tell by the blur on the photo, but let's say everything was perfect. If it's just an apple sitting there, you can't tell if the apple is actually sitting there or if it's rolling, if you have perfect you know, frames per second. In his 1997 book, As the End of Certainty, Time, Chaos, and the New Laws of Nature, Prigogine contends that determinism is no longer a viable scientific belief. The more we know about our universe, the more difficult it becomes to believe in determinism. This is a major departure from the approach of Newton, Einstein, and Schrodinger, all of whom express their theories in terms of deterministic equations. According to Prigogine, determinism loses its explanatory power in the face of irreversibility and instability. Okay, I think he said, and he's a Nobel Prize winner, in 1977, that these dissipative structures defy, really, the second law of thermodynamics. He's also saying here <laughs> that he doesn't believe in determinism. Basically, it can no longer be a valid scientific belief. And by the way, all of our current physics from Newton, Einstein, Schrodinger is all based on determinism. Quantum mechanics really just can't jam in there, can you? That when you find out about the reality of the universe, you just can't. It takes a long time to just squeeze it into those academic models. Prigogine traces the dispute over determinism back to Darwin, whose attempt to explain individual variability according to evolving populations inspired Boltzmann to explain the behavior of gases in terms of populations of particles rather than individual particles. This led to the field of statistical mechanics and the realization that gases undergo irreversible processes. Okay, this is irreversible processes, okay? You live your life, as far as we know, that is not a reversible process. That's an irreversible process. Living systems appear to be irreversible. So how do you explain that? I believe I am more ordered, at least <laughs> my cells and bodies here are more ordered than just the dirt and resources, the environment that I ate, right? I mean, how does it explain that? That doesn't, it's not taking into account any of our, any of our physics and chemistry, essentially. In deterministic physics, all processes are time reversible, meaning that they can proceed backward as well as forward through time. As Prigogine explains, determinism is fundamentally a denial of the arrow of time. You deny this. With no arrow of time, there is no longer a privileged moment known as the present, which follows a determined past and precedes an undetermined future. All of time is simply given, with the future as determined or as undetermined as the past. With irreversibility, the arrow of time is reintroduced to physics. There you go. Irreversibility. Time. The nature of gravity. The nature of light. The nature of consciousness. These are huge questions unanswered. Unanswered. So our science tells us we know. We don't know. Okay, we don't know that much, really. We're learning though. We're trying. As our physicists continue to look further and further into smaller and smaller particles, they're finding there is nothing there, there. Only a data structure. This is what Donald Hoffman believes it is. A data structure. He believes space-time is dead. Consciousness is something that's experienced, something phenomenal. So, for example, my, uh, the taste of coffee, the smell of a rose, uh, the feeling of a headache. These are all specific conscious experiences. And so that's what, I'm, what I mean when I talk about conscious experiences. And what's remarkable is that my, my brilliant friends and colleagues who are, are uh, studying this problem using cognitive neuroscience and or physical systems like artificial intelligences, uh, theories like the integrated information theory or uh, orchestrated collapse of quantum states and microtubules and so forth. What's remarkable is that um, when you look at all these theories, there is not a single specific conscious experience that has ever been explained. What is the pattern of integrated information that must be the taste of vanilla and could not possibly be the smell of a rose? What is the orchestrated collapse, the precise orchestrated collapse 
of quantum states of microtubules that must be the taste of chocolate and, and could not be, uh, you know, the taste of garlic. If you ask, and I, I, these are my friends, and I've asked them in public at, at conferences and so forth, give me a specific conscious experience that you that your theory can tell us. Because it, these are supposed to be theories of conscious experience, so they should explain conscious experiences. So what experience can you explain? What integrated information must be the taste of chocolate or, or whatever one you, you can do? And what's remarkable is there is no physicalist theory or integrated information theory or orchestrated collapse, whatever, there is no theory of that type that can explain even one specific conscious experience. We're batting zero, nothing. There's nothing on the table. Again, look at our definition of gravity. Gravity is not a force. There's no difference between an inertial frame of reference and a gravity frame of reference. There's no difference. Gravity is only seen through time. Time and gravity are somehow intricately related. And Donald Hoffman says it's through some sort of data structure. If the universe is a data structure that we can understand, then we can do amazing new physics. And he thinks we'll just continue to find amazing physics. And if you look, everything we know and touch and see is related to light, how light interacts with other electromagnetic particles. We are electromagnetic beings. Evidence for the Big Bang. So if I were to speculate or assign a purpose to light, I would say it is the fundamental currency used to exchange energy and information from one part of the universe to another. That's a pretty big purpose. That's Arvin Ash. He has an amazing YouTube channel. Like he says, light, everything comes down to light interacting, friction, everything. And if you look down, smaller and smaller particles, we are electromagnetic waves. Indeterminate, probabilistic things, okay? So if you consider that, now relating to my scalar theory of the universe, we can see patterns if we look at the electromagnetic frequency spectrum. If we look at the scale and consider it more as a data structure of frequencies, then we can start to see patterns. And science is all about reproducible patterns and its ability to predict the future. When Dmitry Mendeleev created the periodic table of elements, it was based on designs he observed. In the same way, we can propose a hypothesis for the scales of life and test for patterns of similarities across different dimensional scales. In this case, I aligned the electromagnetic frequency based on sizes of star systems all the way up to the size of the universe. And I noted some repeating patterns. If we look at stars, there would be a B. And then we look down at atomic nuclei, it seems pretty similar. If we look at atoms, right? Most of your mass is in the center, in the nucleus with orbiting, suborbiting uh, particles. And then we go to the A up here. Oh, look, solar systems lines up if these patterns match up, a scalar pattern of the universe would act like a periodic table of the universe. We could better predict the future by understanding our past and our present, by understanding the world, right? So why do I study this? How does it relate to UAPs? Ultimately, we don't understand UAPs because there's a knowledge gap, right? We're missing some key knowledge. There's a knowledge gap between what we know about our world how it works, and what UAPs are. If we know the true nature of the universe, right, the true nature of the universe, then it's probably a lot easier to understand what a UAP is. We'll know what a UAP is. Removing the knowledge gap from our society means removing stupidity, right? If we can make stupidity go lower, then it's better. I define stupidity as ignorance, lack of knowledge, combined with arrogance, confidence in your knowledge, okay? You're okay if you're just ignorant, but you're not thinking you know everything and going and telling everyone and posting it and being so confident that you're willing to kill other people over it, okay? If you combine arrogance with ignorance, you get stupidity. That's stupidity. If you are also, if you're arrogant, but you're correct, you're, you're knowledgeable on that and you're correct. Well, that's actually not stupidity, okay? That's just being correct. But if you're not willing to listen to other options, if you're not willing to consider other angles, perspectives, you're not willing to admit that you can be wrong, okay? Turns out we're all wrong. If you can't admit that you're wrong, 
then that adds up to a lot of stupidity, which we're trying to decrease in this world. But don't worry, we've all been there. The point is we are all stupid. We're all idiots. We're all idiots, okay? We're all humans. We've all been there. We've all been stupid, of course. There's a reason advertisers offer me thousands of dollars to try to convince you to buy one product over others. Probably very similar, if not the exact same or inferior products. Because advertising works. It works on you and it works on me because we are idiots. We're biological machines, idiots. We're just humans. And if you haven't noticed, we're relatively easy to program. So where does the programming come from? It comes from the environment, right? I argue the higher dimension. But a first step is realization. The sooner we realize we're all idiots, the sooner we may possibly stop fighting each other and start working together. Big questions. Could there be alien life around us? Can you travel faster than the speed of light? Is there consciousness after death? Is the nation of your enemy? So think of your, the enemy of your nation. Are they evil? Is the status of the world improving or getting worse? You know, these are big questions. Did you know in 2020, suicide was the second leading cause of death for American teens? So basically 10 to 34 Americans, second leading cause of death was suicide. Why? Top two reasons, lack of hope for the climate, right? Future of Earth and lack of hope in a change in their position. Like they couldn't get a good job. They couldn't live a good life. The young, at least Americans, are killing themselves because they don't see a positive future for the earth or themselves. Which this is exceedingly ironic because for the first time in my life at least, I'm actually positive on the future. I am highly optimistic actually for the future of earth. I think we can have a great future within our single generation. The entire power system of Earth will transition to clean, sustainable energy powered by the giant fusion reactor in the sky. I know, crazy, right? <laughs> How can I be so confident? Is this that arrogance meets ignorance? I don't think so. Humans evolved to this state, to our current state in a kill or be killed world. In the past, it was resource limited, a zero sum world, zero sum game. But with advanced battery tech, artificial intelligence, robotics, we will have a society of abundance in just one generation. We have more than enough resources to go around, literally. We have, we have plenty of resources. Earth is hit by more nuclear energy every hour than we need. An electric infrastructure will need half the power. So with tunnel technology, we can re-green the whole Earth, re-green the wilds. I know you guys don't believe this, but it's totally possible right now with our current technology. It's not only wishful thinking. This will happen. It doesn't matter whether you want it to or not. It's going to happen. Thanks to Elon Musk and Tesla. He did it. They did it. They're pushing it now. It's going to happen. And the NASA DART program, if you didn't know about that, where they shot a meteor, it worked exceedingly well. So we can actually deflect asteroids and meteors. So that civilization destroying effect danger is gone. So now it looks like maybe super volcanoes or some weird other universal environmental effect we don't know about, our own stupidity is the most dangerous thing of affecting the future of the human race. So we have everything we need. We have a great future lined up. Only thing that can happen is us. If we mess it up. Don't screw it up, humans. All right, hope you enjoyed this video. It's a theory video, I know different, but very passionate about it. I really believe all these things and I am very positive for the future, like for the first time, exceedingly positive and I think for me, it started with having an open mind, considering that uh, I can be wrong. You know, I don't know that there's no life after death. <laughs> and now it looks like pff, my views has changed. You know, how do you describe consciousness? We can't even describe time. So there's much to know and don't think that it's so negative. I think we can definitely do it, guys. So, and I think we'll find out about uh, the phenomenon, the more we find out about the universe. So this is the information age. I was hoping it'd pay off. It looks like it will. So thanks for being here, everybody. Smash that like button. If you do like this video, subscribe to get future content. And then you want to support the channel and get backstage access. That includes early videos, exclusive content, and no ads. Then go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Have a great day. Peace.